Hey, you know, you feel like some company? I want to FaceTime some friends. What you think? Oh, yeah, let's talk you to FaceTime some friends. All right. Uh, now, oh, look at these two guys. Listen, two of the smartest, most respected voices I know. These two gentlemen, Dave Zarin and Nitan Thomas, co hosts of The Collision, these two cats been on the front lines of the intersection of sports and politics before it was trendy. So if we were going to look back at week one, and not just week one, but also we'll talk about Naomi Osaka. We're going to look at athlete activism right now. Who better to talk to than Dave Zarin, That's right. sports editor at The Nation, and former NBA player Tom Thomas, noted author and motivational speaker. Fellas, thank you all for coming in. Uh, Itan, I'll start with you, man. Listen, uh, just what was your takeaway from the demonstrations across the league uh, yesterday throughout the NFL? Oh, goodness. I mean, well, it was really the response. I mean, going back to, you know, you know Kansas, Kansas City and the, the booze that happened after that. And it was so crazy because, you know, it was right before September 11th. And it could have been this moment where you had like a storybook. You know what I mean? Like it, like the black players and white pair players, you know, standing together in unity to, you know, fight for equality, all, all of that stuff. And, you know, the Kansas City fans just ruined it. They just booed. And I was like, wait, they're booing? Equality? Like, what? They're, they're not even, this, this has nothing to do with the national anthem this time because they're not kneeling during the national anthem. This all took place after it. So it, that that was disheartening to really see. And I saw the mayor was like, you know, a few people in Kansas City did this, but not all of us. You know, I'm like, ah, that might be wishful thinking. Them booze sounded kind of loud. So I think it just ruined mm. what could have been a very special moment. And I'll, I'll ask you both, uh, Eton and Dave, why do you think they booed? Let's just get right to it. Why did they boo, in your opinion? No, go ahead, Dave. All right. Well, there's so much to say. Why did they boo? I mean, they booed because the league has conditioned the fans for the last four years to actually disagree with the idea of players using their platform to mm -hmm. speak out for racial justice, let alone speak out against police brutality. Like, I put this on the NFL as much as I put it on the fans. It's the NFL that has exiled Colin Kaepernick. It's the NFL that has sent the message to the players themselves about what they can or cannot do. It's the NFL that now is trying to switch their tune because they're dancing as fast as they can. Roger Goodell is doing a soft shoe like Sammy Davis Jr. because he's so terrified at the thought of NFL players going on strike like their NBA and Major League Baseball brethren and, and seeing uh, the billions of dollars go down the tubes if that takes place. And so that gets to the original question, Michael, about what I thought of yesterday. I thought it was like this very interesting battle and fight between what the NFL was trying to put forward and then players themselves trying to fight through that fog, fight through that mm. branding for Black Lives Matter and trying to have a message actually heard about police brutality and police violence. So you had that amazing scene out in Atlanta, which I think we should got to talk more about. I thought it was one of the most amazing things I've ever seen of Seattle kicking off and then them letting mm -hmm. just the ball fall to the turf and then both teams take a knee. Um, I spoke to somebody who was talking to the Seattle players about this plan. That was totally worked out without management. That was the players talking to each other. And that's the kind of demonstrations that gives me a sense of confidence. Yeah, if it, if it was player led, absolutely, because that's much less permissive. And much, it feels much less co-opted, what you're talking about. It feels much less coordinated, uh, and, you know, and, and just, it just frankly kind of watered down at times. That's, that's what kind of frustrates me about the whole thing is, you know, we've come, the pendulum has swung to the opposite extreme, which feels like it almost undermines the power and, and, and the provocation of the protests because it's so packaged and prepared. And you use the word branding just now, Dave. It's just, you know, everybody's kind of, you know, across the league trying so hard to, to strike a balance of neutrality. You know what I mean? They're, try, they're, trying, to, they're trying to have something that's not controversial, that doesn't offend it, on, and it feels like that completely takes away from the meaning of a protest. Well, I mean, I'd have to respectfully disagree, especially when it comes to the NBA. You know, and me and Dave are going back and forth on this topic a lot. You know, the, the Adam mm -hmm. Silver is a lot different than David Stern. So under David Stern, you know, you know, everybody has to remember that Craig Hodges and Mahmoud Abdul-Aruf got whiteballed under David Stern. Adam Silver is a little yeah. bit different. So when you're working with players to be able to value their voices and, and it's, it's a totally different relationship. So it doesn't have to be as much adversarial. Mm -hmm. If it was David Stern, oh, then it would be completely the players against them, against management. So it would be a completely different uh, situation as, as a whole. Well just, well, just to clarify something, I'm strictly talking about the NFL in that case. 
in this in this case okay. because there's, there's at least Adam Silver in that league. That's a, we know that's a black league and a players league. There's some credibility there from an NBA standpoint, more so at least compared to the NFL is what I mean. I'm strictly talking about the juxtaposition yeah. of an NFL that's that's blackball Kaepernick and Reed having in racism in its end zone, Dave Zyre. Yeah, if, if you had played a drinking game yesterday and taken a shot every single time that the announcers actually used the word police, you would have been stone sober by the end of three hours, six hours, or nine hours. I mean, there was such an effort to phrase it in terms of this is about unity, this is about racial uplift, this is about uh, the league coming together to say, can we do more? And it's like, do more about what? Uplift against what? What are you talking about <laughs> right. when it, it not right. saying that? No, it, it's like, what is this really being informed by when you say things like enough or how many more finish that sentence? It's how many more people have to die at the hands of police enough with unarmed people of color being killed by police. It's like they don't want to say that part because that's when it gets really polarizing. And that's when it goes from a celebration of unity to an actual demand. You, you, re you referenced uh, Mike uh, Kaepernick's tweet about blackballing Kaepernick and Reed out of the league, right? Why Reed though? I mean, Reed played last year, <laughs> and if they are, if they are trying to keep him out of the league, it's a little late. Why are they trying to keep league, uh, Reed out of the league right now? If you agree with that position from Kaepernick, uh, Dave, and then uh, Etan from you. Here's a, here's a tweet right now. Well, I think it's just that, that Reed is sitting there at 28 years old. Uh, he set uh, franchise records last year for the Carolina Panthers. And it just it leaves this question that's just hanging there about why doesn't Eric Reed have work at this point? I mean, given what we saw yesterday in this pass happy league, I mean, my goodness, when Gardner Minshew is completing 95% of his passes, you might need some decent safety work out there in the NFL. And here's Eric Reed's just just sitting there. And so it just, I think it raises that question again and again about who is allowed and who isn't allowed in the league. Cause I'm still convinced like when it comes to ownership in the NFL, they like having these players out of the league so they can use them as kind of ghost stories to tell the younger players about you need to stay in line and listen. So there, I do think mm. we're also seeing now a gap between the NFL offices, Roger Goodell, his team over there and what they're trying to do. And then these 32 or really 31 because of Green Bay, but 31 very conservative um, over white, except for Jacksonville owners uh, who have a different kind of political agenda. Hey, Tom. Oh, yeah, I definitely agree with everything Dave just said. I mean, you know, Eric Reed is it's interesting because it, it takes me back to seeing Jay-Z and Roger Goodell, you know, at the press conference while Kaepernick is still white balled from the league. You know, I mean, right. they're talking about they want to move forward. They want to do this. And they want to do that. But meanwhile, Kaepernick is still white balled from the league. And so yeah. it's, it's, it's interesting because, you know, Eric Reed has was been, he was right there kneeling with Kaepernick the entire time. And even though that he was in the league last year, they made it pretty tough for him. You know what I mean? There's the reason why he was talking about why am I getting drug tested all these times? Like, why am I, you know, and, and it was almost as if they wanted him to be out of the league to say, okay, he's one of the bad ones. All right, we're going to put him over there with Kaepernick, but you all, you know, we're going to be able to work with you and you have to have somebody that says, okay, well, that's not all right. You know what? Uh, uh, I... Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, Go no, ahead, each, each, let me just ask uh, one more. Uh, I have an NBA question I want to ask okay. before we, uh, before we step off here. You know, George Hill was very outspoken with the Milwaukee Bucks. He said, hey, look, we should have never come to this damn bubble. And this is, this is right after the James Blake uh, uh, shooting in Kenosha. And other players were saying, hey, it didn't work. Our messaging, you know, Black Lives Matter, we're saying all this stuff, it didn't work. Uh, one, do, do you agree with that? Do you agree that they, they never should have come to the bubble and they should have stayed outside, to, uh, outside of that bubble to, to get their message across? And is, is it working or was it working? Uh, in your opinion? I think that there's, I think that there's a case to be made for both of them, to be honest with you, in all honesty. I think there's a case to be made for both. And it's just interesting seeing people like, you know, I don't, I, sometimes I don't like calling out specific names, but seeing people like Stephen A. Smith, we'll just say Stephen A. Smith for a minute. You know, we can say him now. We, you know, we're not on ESPN or anything like that. We can say somebody. somebody, somebody <laughs> we can say somebody, anything. Right? We can say anything here, Eton. Anything. Go ahead. <laughs> But but you see where all the players when they when they when they decided to 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 um to protest and they started they decided to boycott and everything like that for for the few games right two games 
you saw all the people all of a sudden say, oh, we praise these players. It's great what they're doing, how much respect they have. But then just a little bit while before, they lambasted people like Kyrie Irving, like Dwight Howard, like Avery Bradley, when he was suggesting that players not go into the bubble for that very reason that yeah. you just, just, just said. And I think it's interesting because there are different ways to be able to approach this. I mean, you saw back in the 68 Olympics, you saw John Carlos and Tommy Smith, they went to the Olympics and they had a they had a um, a demonstration and they had a moment that is solidified in time even to today. But then you had somebody like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar who elected not to go. And so both right. of them deserve respects. I just don't like why at that time there was such this divide of saying, okay, the players that want to go, you know, they're doing things the right way. The players that don't want to go, they're complete buffoons and they're fools and they have no idea what they're talking about. And it wasn't just Stephen A. Yeah. Smith. It was, it was Charles Barkley. It was Michael Wilbon. I, I, you know, it was a lot of people. So now when you're seeing players say, okay, this didn't really work the way that we thought that it, that it would have worked, they, they, they have a legitimate argument. What I would like to see for the players to do is to ask for more. They have everybody's attention. They had a board of governors meeting there. You know what I mean? And I want to see them ask for more. I want to see them push these billionaire CEOs. I don't call them owners for obvious reasons, but I want to see them push them to be able to use their power and their influence in this particular cities where they're in to push for actual change. The way that we just saw yeah. FedEx push for the, the Washington football team to change the name. And they said, if you don't, you're going to lose us as sponsors. You know what I mean? That's what makes people change. Not because Dan Snyder just woke up and said, you know what? I'm tired of offending these Native American people. I think I'm going to... You start you know messing what? with their money. Right, yeah, start, you yeah, start you messing start with their money. money. Everything changes. But these billionaire saw, CEOs, they have the power to go into the cities where they are and pressure the city to do that yeah. same thing with police departments. I want the players to ask for more. Like, don't just be satisfied with, you know, them saying Black Lives Matter in the camera. Or anything like that. I, I want. I want more from them. All right, Etan and Dave, you guys can come back here and hang out anytime with us. We appreciate you coming on. There's uh, much more with this conversation. So, uh, hey, thank you, thank you for joining us in our first show. In our first show. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.